And I trust that things will get better for you even this week. We have a, a great guy speaking tonight, one of our CEO of the BMF in the UK, Stephen Turnbull. He's going to be sharing in a moment. And uh, just to tell you again, we're streaming uh, live on Facebook. If you have any questions, send them on the Facebook post to Paul Fenton. If you have any questions and you're watching on Zoom, you can send those to Paul as well. And uh, please pass on uh, to your friends, share with them the post, the Facebook post tonight, so that many other people can be blessed by the message tonight. So Stephen, it's great to have you with us tonight. Stephen, as I say, is from Scotland. He has been a businessman, but now he's involved in psychology and he's got a lot of wonderful stories to tell of how God has used him in that area. And I'm sure tonight you will be really encouraged by what Stephen has to share. He's been an encouragement to so many, many people in different sports and different uh, walks of life. And tonight, I'm sure you'll be helped by what Stephen has to share. Stephen, are you there? You muted. Stephen? I'm here now, yeah. You're there now, <laughs> right. Okay, we welcome you, Stephen. It's over to you. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in this evening. Uh, I hope you find uh, some benefit in what you're going to hear tonight. Um, so let me just uh, tell you my my story. I, I find I find everybody's journey in life fascinating. I really do. Uh, it's the psychologist in me. Um, it's the Christian in me. Uh, and my story starts off um, in Scotland, where I was born and grew up. And I grew up in a Christian home, uh, and I, I, I liked going to church uh, for a while, and uh, I enjoyed uh, listening to the stories, the Bible stories. I especially loved the stories of Jesus, what a character. This guy raised people from the dead, made friends that, uh, with people that society had rejected, very charismatic character, uh, the miracles. I was totally totally um, besotted with uh, this character um, but I believed at the time that these were just stories that's what I thought I thought they were a, a great story um, the church I, I went to um, uh, I think it's the experience of a lot of people um, in the church of Scotland where I grew up that uh, people went to a good new, went to church for the, a good news bible but uh, the they had a bad news face. You know, what they were learning in the Bible wasn't really shown in their life. There wasn't a great amount of joy, happiness. And so that made me think that these Bible stories are just stories. And I did ask the question, when you hit those teenage years, everybody does the same, I think. They asked the big question, why am I here? What's life all about? How can I get the best out of life? And it was when I was asking these questions that uh, my life really changed. When I was 15, uh, my grandmother, who was a Christian, was involved in a terrible car accident, actually going home from, from church. And this car accident, um, she sustained terrible injuries, uh, terrible head injuries, um, some broken bones. And uh, she was in a coma for a week when the, the doctors gave a diagnosis to say that um, they didn't think that she would recover from this coma. They didn't think that she would wake up. Uh, the testing had shown severe brain damage such that she would never be able to walk again or talk or feed herself. And uh, pneumonia had got into her lungs and uh, the doctors recommended to the family that the pneumonia was not treated and she just slipped away. My grandfather relayed that information to the family were devastated but my grandfather said now I'm going to ask the minister from the church to come and pray for our healing and I remember speaking to my grandfather and saying to him is that not a complete waste of time these experts have told us that uh, it's impossible that um, it's over and my grandfather said to me that the bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever he healed 2,000 years ago. He still heals today, Stephen. And so 
I went home that night really challenged by that. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I prayed really for the first time in my life. And I prayed and said, God, if, if you're real, I need to know. If you are the God of the Bible, it's nothing to you to heal my grandmother. My goodness, you, re you raise people from the dead. You are the God of miracles, according to the Bible. So if you're real, I need to know that you're real. I'm asking that you would heal my grandmother. If you do, then I'll, I'll put my faith in you. If you don't, then you are just a story. And the next day uh, at, the, uh, at the church, at, the, uh, at the, the hospital, this minister came into the little room that my grandmother was in, this little side room. This uh, very elderly, small gentleman came in uh, with a little bottle of oil and he put some oil on his finger and made the sign of the cross on my grandmother's forehead and said a simple prayer. I just asked Jesus that you bring healing to this body. And as he said that, there was a power, a presence came into the room. It was incredible. Uh, you, you could tangibly feel it. You couldn't see it, but you could feel this power of his presence. And the, the hairs on the back of your neck would st stand up. And my grandmother, she opened her eyes and she sat up in bed and she started talking and asked why our son had came, was, was here from Canada. Uh, it was incredible. It was incredible. We called the doctors and said, how is this possible? And the, after the examinations, the doctor said, and this is the words that he used, uh, the age of miracles is not over. And it absolutely blew me away. And I went home that night and in the privacy of my own bedroom, I got down on my knees and I prayed and said, God, I believe you are the God of the Bible. And I give you my life. I, I, I ask for forgiveness for everything I've done wrong. I believe in you. I'm asking you to come into my heart and whatever you want to do with my life, that's okay with me. I'm yours. And that changed my life forever, the course of my life. That was, my goodness, 31 years ago. Uh, and this journey in life for the last 31 years has been incredible. It's been amazing. Uh, I sought to pursue a, a deeper relationship with God. After that, this was me just getting to know him. Uh, I looked at the scriptures in a, a different way now. I, I really wanted to know God more about him because wow I'd give him, given him my life and I read lots of things in the New Testament about God giving uh, gifts and basically the power to live to live for him and to serve him well and I started to ask some questions about that um, and uh, at that time my my neighbor just uh, lived a few houses away from us he um would go to a businessman's group called Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. And uh, my father went to one of the meetings um, that they, they would hold monthly dinner meetings and someone would give a testimony just like this, a life story, and they talk about how they came to know God and uh, testify about the, the power and the goodness of God and the impact God can have in your life and through your life. And uh, my father um, told me about this meeting and uh, I thought, I, I have to go and see this for myself. And I asked my neighbour, can I go to, to one of your meetings? And he said, of course you can. I was just a young lad. I was just, just turned 18 and uh, went to the, the dinner. And uh, before we went, my neighbour, he told me all about um, uh, some of the things that would happen at the meeting. He said, you know, Stephen, have you read the New Testament? I said, yeah, of, of, of course. I've read large parts of the New Testament. I've been a Christian for three years now. He said, you know, there's lots of things happen in the New Testament that doesn't happen in your church. And he started to talk about the, the gifts that uh, God empowers his people with. He said, you'll see some of these gifts tonight. You'll, you'll hear people speak in tongues, perhaps. And if someone does speak in tongues, this heavenly language or another earthly language, then that's God speaking. And, and uh, whenever that happens, the there will be an interpretation and you'll hear what the interpretation is. I'd never seen anything like this before. I'd never witnessed it before. And sure enough, after the, the, the meal, there was a speaker who spoke uh, for a long time. And uh, uh, the speaker said that um, uh, 
so I have a message tonight for for three people, and um, one of them was was me pointing to me and said, you know, uh, God's told me that um, sometimes you look with your your eyes, but you don't really see, and sometimes you uh, you listen, but you don't really hear. But if you look and listen with with your heart, you'll know exactly uh, what's from God and what is not from God. And that night, I I heard someone speak in tongues for the first time um, and I'll be honest it kind of freaked me out someone speaking in what sounded like Arabic um, I said oh wait now my, my, my neighbour told me about this and if, if this is someone speaking it's not just nonsense that's coming out of their mouth if this is God speaking through this person there will be an interpretation and yeah um, after this uh, speaker uh, spoke someone gave an interpretation and, and it was a message. And again, it was along the same lines of what uh, the speaker had said to me, that um, that uh, if, you, if you look and, and listen with, with your heart, um, you'll really know what's from God and what's not from God. And as we went home that night, I um, sat in my neighbor's car outside his garage. And uh, I said to him, you know, I, a lot of things I saw tonight that I'd never seen before. I saw people getting prayed for and, and falling over as they were being healed. I'd never seen that before. I'd never heard someone speak in tongues before. I'd never heard anyone give an interpretation before. I said, you know what? I, I really believe that those things were from God. And as I said that, I felt what was like an energy force uh, just hit my body. Um, all the positive emotions you can think of, love, joy, peace, excitement, confidence, power. I could feel all these emotions bubbling up inside me and it started to shake my body. And I said, uh, I said to my neighbor, what's, what's happening? And he's put his hand up beside me and he prayed and this feeling intensified tenfold. And it was the most powerful and amazing experience of my life for the next two minutes as this power moved through my body it was the same kind of power that I felt uh, in the room when my grandmother was healed and now I could actually feel it inside my body moving through my body and it was wonderful fantastic and after a couple of minutes it stopped I said wow what just happened and my neighbor said congratulations you've just been baptized in the holy spirit I said, what's that? I had no idea. Um, so I had to read up on it, learn about it. And uh, what I've been searching for, this power that God, you, you would think that when, when you give your life to God, the creator of the universe, the creator of all things, that he would equip you and, and empower you to, to live life in a powerful way. And he does. He does. I discovered that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, his, his spirit, his Holy Spirit can dwell within you within your life and can empower you to live the most beautiful, wonderful, uh, inspirational life, um, the life that you were created to live. I'd asked that question when I was 15, how am I going to get the best out of life? Uh, my answer to that, and 31 years later, I can totally, completely, 100% confidently say the answer to that is by living life with God and being empowered by him, by his Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about this relationship with God. It, it talks greatly about how uh, we live life with God and are empowered by him and we uh, follow his plan as well. The Bible tells us that he has a plan for our life, a plan to bring prosperity and not disaster, hope and a future. And again, that is my, my testimony. When I turned 18 and I was baptised with the Holy Spirit, I started working and studying at the same time. I actually started working in construction and house building. And again, inspired by the scriptures, the scripture says that you should work as if you're working for God. And I, I decided that I was going to do the best that I could in house building. That I was going to work as hard as I could and, uh, and be the best quantity surveyor that I could be. Um, a quantity surveyor is someone who uh, works on the costs of, of building projects and manages the budgets and uh, predicts uh, profitability, etc. And I worked hard for the companies that um, employed me 
uh, as if I was working for God, doing my absolute best. And uh, that really helped me in my, in my career. It gave me promotion after promotion. Um, and I would pray every day. I would go to work. I would pray uh, and I would ask God, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do today? And sometimes God would speak. Now, that's a big statement to make there, that God speaks. That he speaks to us. Again, the Bible tells us that he speaks to us um, in many different ways through, through his words, um, through other Christians, but also that he speaks through uh, a still small voice, a bit, a bit like your conscience almost, not quite an audible voice, but a still small voice. So how do you know it's, it's not your conscience? How do you know it's not just thoughts in your head? I'm going to give you a lot of examples of times that God has spoken to me to give me direction and I've been obedient and followed that direction and my goodness it's it shaped my life uh, one day um, when I was at work uh, working for a, a, a civil engineering company who worked for house builders I was praying and say Lord what do you want me to do today and uh, this still small voice spoke to me and said I want, I want you to study more I want you to study um, a master's degree and I want you to go and ask the owner of the company to sponsor you. And here's the words that you have to use. Very, very precise. And I went and spoke to the owner of the company, a big company, employed 500 people, and employed 50 uh, at a turnover of 50 million pounds. And uh, I spoke these words in, uh, in this owner's office after asking to speak with him and said, you know, I want to be the best employee that I can be for you. And one of the ways I believe I can do that is if you were to sponsor me to, to further my studies, to expand my knowledge, my, my experience and my education. And I think uh, an investment like that in me would, would pay dividends for your company. I just want to do the best job I can for you. And the owner of the company said, uh, Stephen, you'll never believe this. For 30 years, I've always wanted someone to walk through my door and say they wanted to be the best that they could be for me, for my company, to do the best job they could do for me, of course, I'll sponsor you to, to uh, study further. And so I did. And uh, lo and behold, the, uh, a year later, um, the owner of the company promoted me to be head of the department I was in, youngest in the department. And uh, my career really took off uh, in a big, big way. Uh, so much so that one day the owner of the company said, uh, Stephen, I want to make you a director of this company. And if I make you a director of this company, you'll be a director for life. I was only in my early 30s at the time. Um, I thought, this is great. This is great. Working for a great company, a cash-rich company, uh, very successful, great reputation. I really enjoy my job. This is everything I want. Um, but I prayed about it. I prayed about everything. I said, Lord, the this great day has come where they've offered me this job for life. My goodness, I'll be financially set for life. What a great career I'll have here. Um, should I accept the offer? And this still small voice said, no. I said, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? This, this is a great offer. Uh, and the Lord said, I've got something better for you. Wow, that was a big step of faith. Uh, kind of long story short. The Lord called me to start my own company, uh, building houses, uh, which I did. And within two years, uh, following uh, the Lord's lead, uh, my company went to a £3 million turnover, uh, which was great, and won industry awards along the way. Uh, industry awards for excellence. Uh, there was a lot of miraculous things happened along the way. And this first project uh, we, we bought a part of a farm just outside Edinburgh in Scotland on the edge of a country park. And uh, the farm buildings that we, we bought were over 150 years old and we converted them into living luxury houses. And uh, when it came to sell these houses, again, prayed about it. Lord, what do you want me to do? And the direction came very clear. I want you to sell the houses. I thought, are you sure? <laughs> I don't know anything about selling houses. Um, and, and the Lord instructed me that um, uh, I should sell these houses. Nobody knows this product better than me. Um, and so I wrote the marketing material. Uh, we launched uh, our marketing campaign. 
in, in the Scotsman newspaper, uh, one advert in this newspaper. And uh, again, uh, the Lord gave us a title for this advert. Uh, I'd studied the history of the farm and found out that the farmhouse, which was a castle, uh, was a, a hunting lodge for two of Scotland's kings, uh, James IV and James VI of Scotland. James VI was uh, um, King James of the King James Bible. And uh, they would use uh, Elliston, uh, was the name of the place. Elliston was their hunting lodge, the, their leisure uh, place that we go to, to relax, to go hunting with their friends, the other nobles, etc. And so uh, we were building luxury houses beside this uh, ancient hunting lodge. And so the title for the advert was uh, Luxury in the Playground of Kings. Uh, and it was great. Um, the response to the advert was fantastic. And we sold all our houses in one week, all 11 houses in one week, three million pounds worth of houses in one week off of that advert. Other developers before that uh, got to know them pretty well. It's a small industry in Scotland. And uh, they laughed at me before that when they said, when they were asking, which company are you going to use to sell these houses? So well, we're going to do it ourselves. In fact, I'm going to do it myself. And they laughed. They said, you crazy. You know, you don't know how to sell houses. This is important stuff. Even when you've invested millions of pounds in this project, you, you must go to the experts. I've told them, you know, I'm a man of faith and I believe this is what I should do. Uh, after that, when we sold the houses in one week, we actually broke three Scottish housing records. Um, and uh, two of these companies came and asked me for marketing advice after that, which was uh, a great. But um, uh, moving on from there, uh, the world was hit by an economic re recession in 2008. And uh, through no fault of my own, uh, through no fault of my own, my company struggled because whenever there's an economic recession, uh, always housing and property is affected in a great way. And there was no more market for my houses. I was on a second project uh, near Glasgow in the Clyde Valley. And I just committed uh, one and a half million pounds on this project, building these houses. You buy the land at a certain value. You know how much it's going to cost to build. Uh, and uh, you can ascertain what you project the value to be um, to make the, the project profitable. Unfortunately, the value that we based them on, which was the, the market price just before the recession, well, that market price changed dramatically um, by almost a third. And uh, all of a sudden, our project was a loss maker uh, through no fault of my own. The whole industry, the whole, system, the whole world had changed economically. And um, I actually lost every penny that I had after winning Scotland's House of the Year Awards, which was the number one award for house building um, that year. Um, we actually lost every penny that we had. That's life. That's life. And uh, the smart money would have been going back to work as a quantity surveyor. I could have got a, a, a top job pretty easily um, based on my previous records and uh, replenished uh, the money that I'd lost. But again, I prayed, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? You've got the plan. You have the whole plan for my life. What do you want me to do? And I was very clearly directed to uh, move into psychology. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an incredible story. Again, um, something that you could not make up, something that could not be influenced by your own thoughts or your own uh, desires or wants. The um, Lord spoke to me through three people, people I'd never met before. And they all said the same thing. The first person was a woman from Australia. Uh, I bumped into her in, in a, a town in Scotland called Livingston. Uh, we got talking and she said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, I am. I said, I believe I have a word from the Lord for you. And, and she said, uh, you're about to be asked to go to America. Um, and you'll think of three reasons why you can't go. But you must go. Because when you go there, um, you're going to be gifted with something. Um, and the reason you were born, the reason you were created, was to help people to fulfill their full God-given potential. And God is about to gift you and enable you to help people, to help you to remove barriers from people's minds, and people will fulfill their full God-given potential. And people from all around the world will seek you out for this gift, and you will help them, and they will fulfill 
their full God-given potential. When she said that, I kind of shook my head and said, I'm not so sure that word's for me. It just sounded too fantastical, um, too ridiculous. Uh, a few months, uh, a few weeks later, actually, I was uh, in a prayer meeting in the north of England, and uh, the main speaker there was a, a pastor from a church in Jamaica. Never met him before, didn't know anything about me. And uh, he came and spoke to me and said, I believe the Lord's given me a word for you. And he said, the reason you were born, the reason you were created was to help people to fulfill their full God-given potential. And God is about to gift you and enable you to remove the barriers from people's minds. And they will fulfill their full God-given potential. And people from all around the world will seek you out for this gift. And you will help them. And they will fulfill their full God-given potential. I thought, wow, I've heard this before. So uh, I did um, go to America. I was invited by uh, Ronnie Spenhart, um, um, who uh, asked me to go to speak at um, a conference in Atlanta, Georgia, attend the conference anyway. And immediately when he asked me, I, I thought of three reasons why I couldn't go. And I spoke to him straight away. Uh, I can't go, that's my uh, 10th wedding anniversary. Um, I can't go um, because I'm trying to save my company um, from, from going bust. Uh, and I can't go because I have no money. I've, I've pretty much lost all my money. Um, these were three very good, very valid reasons. Who would uh, uh, not spend their 10th wedding anniversary with their wife? Yes, um, that's a big one. But uh, I spoke with my wife uh, about it. I remembered this word from this woman from Australia. And my, my wife said, um, you know, if, if God's speaking, you have to be faithful. Why wouldn't you be? What's more important than that? And so uh, I took a step of faith. I went to America and an amazing thing happened there that um, the main speaker, when, um, when he was speaking uh, at one of the, uh, the sessions, um, he stopped and said, I, I need to speak to this, this guy here. And he, he pointed at me and um, again, and spoke to me and said the same words that the um, woman from Australia had said, the pastor from Jamaica had said, and he got everyone in the room to reach out their hands and pray for me. He said, because God's going to gift this guy right now. And he prayed, and uh, I felt that power, that power come on me again, that, that power, that presence that healed my grandmother, that power and presence that, that uh, invaded beautifully my, my body and my being when I was 18 and uh, equipped me and I felt empowered uh, and after that I took a step of faith and uh, my psychology uh, career um, started very very quickly. I'd studied some psychology when I studied this master's degree um, when I was working in construction and um, I uh, started to I took the step of faith and and people came to me. I never even had to advertise that I was going to be working in psychology. I didn't know how to start. I didn't know what to do, but I took a step of faith and, and believed that the Lord was calling me to do this. So I, I remained open. And uh, it was actually someone I knew in construction came and spoke to me and said, Stephen, I, this recession is, is killing me. I struggle to get out of bed in the morning. I'm struggling with depression and anxiety. Uh, I can't remember the last time I smiled. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. This is terrible. I'm going to lose my business. You seem to have recovered well. How did you do that? I said, well, Frank, two things. Uh, number one, I'm a man of faith. I prayed. I believe the Lord helped me greatly to recover from my challenges I was facing. And very honestly, I said, I'm not really interested in that. So, okay. Uh, second thing was, uh, I got my psychology books out. I studied psychology before and I I was struggling with thoughts of depression and anxiety, and I did taste depression and anxiety for a very short time. Um, but uh, I read these um, psychology notes. I read, skim read 200 psychology books in, in a space of a few months. Um, and uh, I really felt the Lord shone a light on, on certain techniques that I should use, use them on myself. They worked tremendously. Um, I shared them with Frank. I had three sessions with him. By the end of the third session, he had a big smile on his face. He said, I'm smiling again. The weight of the world is off my shoulders. It's incredible. 
um, I feel like a new man. And uh, he started to tell other people about what I, I did for him. And uh, other people came to me and said, could you do for me what you did for Frank? So all of a sudden I had this client base uh, and doors opened very, very quickly in many, many places. And uh, I've, working, I've been working in psychology now for 11 years, my own practice. I've never advertised my work. Never once have I had to advertise. Um, yet. Yeah, uh, I've had over 4,000 clients that have came to me. Um, fantastic. The test for psychology, one of the international kind of studies that have worked out how effective psychologists are, one of the tests says one year after you start working with someone, are they free of their symptoms? Um, the average answer is 70% of people um, who go to a psychologist will be free of their symptoms within one year. Um, from my own stats in the last uh, 10, 11 years, 98% of my clients are free of their symptoms. Uh, and it never usually takes as long as a year. I pray for every client I work with. I don't pray with them. That wouldn't be appropriate. But I pray for them. And I ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? Please, will you guide me to, to ask the right questions, to use the right techniques, to understand exactly what's happening with this person? And if you want to give me some insight, um, I'm, I'm all ears. And some tremendous things have happened uh, over the years with uh, clients I've worked with. Uh, let me give you some uh, examples here. Uh, I'm going to start off with an example in, in football or soccer for you guys that are watching from America. Um, I worked in the Scottish Premiership um, with a team, um, St. Mernon, for a few years uh, as a consultant. And there was a player there who uh, was technically very gifted in training, brilliant, could do wonderful things in, in the training sessions. But when it came to playing on, on match day, he really struggled with confidence and was a shadow of himself. And they asked me, is there anything you can do with him? And uh, I, I worked with him, gave him some confidence techniques, and really worked on building his confidence. And uh, this so happens that um, one day when I was driving through to, to uh, Paisley to one of the games, uh, the routine on match day was always, um, it's a three o'clock kickoff, so all the staff had to be in for 12.30 to have lunch with the manager. Coaches would all have lunch with the manager in the manager's office and we would chat and talk and uh, then other coaches would all leave and um, I'd be myself and the manager that's left and we'd chat for about 20 minutes about the psychology of the game, uh, certain things we should be saying with, with the players to, to build up the motivation, the confidence, etc. But as I was driving through to the game that day um, to have lunch, I was praying, as I always do, Father, help me to be the best psychologist I can be today. Help me to, to serve you well, to, to be alert to the needs of others um, and ask that you give me any direction that you deem necessary. And as I prayed that day, this happens, it was Christmas Eve uh, and unusually there was a game on Christmas Eve. As I was going through to the game, the um, Lord spoke to me very clearly and said, tell the manager to pick this player, Aaron Moy is his name. Uh, tell the manager to start Arvin Moy in the game today. And I said, I can't do that. If I tell the manager who should be in the team, he'll sack me. It's not appropriate. It's, it's crossing the line. And the Lord said to me again, tell the manager that he should be starting Arvin Moy today. And when he asks you, and he will, why he should start Aaron in the game today, tell him that Aaron is the type of player that picks up the ball 25 yards from goal, can beat a defender, and get a shot and goal. So um, I was a little bit nervous, um, I'll, I'll be honest, that uh, when the coaches left after lunch, it was just the manager and I, and the manager says, so Stephen, what's on your mind today? And I said, well, uh, uh, Danny, who's the manager, um, I've got something to say. You, you know I'm a Christian and I, and I pray, and, I, and, uh, and Danny had came to faith just uh, a year before that. And uh, I said, when I was praying today, God told me to say to you, you have to start Aaron Moy in the team today. He said, well, funny you should say that. He said, I haven't finished picking the team for today and I can't decide between Nigel Hasselbank and Aaron Moy for the number 10 position. So tell me, why does God think that I should start Aaron Moy in this football match today? I said, well, God told me <laughs> that uh, Aaron Moy is the type of player that can pick up the ball 25 yards from goal, beat a player and get a strike on goal. Danny said, well, 
you know what, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. Uh, I'm going to put Aaron Moy in the team today. Uh, and lo and behold, in this game against the uh, Rangers, who were the reigning champions in the league that year, um, in the 44th minute of the game, just before halftime, Aaron Moy picks up the ball 25 yards from goal, skips past the defender, who was uh, Sasa Papac, the centre-half for Rangers that day, and unleashed a shot from 25 yards. And I went straight in the top corner, and that was Aaron's first ever goal, uh, senior goal in football. And we actually went on to beat Rangers that day. We beat the league champions that day. Um, one of St Martin's most famous victories in recent times. Tremendous. And Aaron went on to play in the, the best league in the world. He's playing in the English Premiership, uh, earning two or three million pounds a year now and uh, playing um, in the World Cup finals with Australia. All because um, I was uh, <laughs> obedient to what the Lord said uh, and Aaron got his first goal. Um, other examples of uh, intervention. Uh, one, one night, unusually, I went to see a client. Um, I'd actually worked with his wife before. And uh, this guy phoned me and said, I have a problem. He never told me what the problem was. But my wife recommended yourself. And so um, could you come and see me? So I went to his house the next night. Um, he hadn't told me what the problem was. Unusually, I got there early. So I stopped a street away. Uh, from his house and I prayed uh, again father pray that you would help me to, to be the best psychologist I can be tonight um, you would help me to ask the right questions to listen well and, uh, and use the right techniques to bring about the healing that this man needs um, and if you've got any insight I'd love to hear it because the bible tells us the lord knows everybody inside out he knows the number of hairs on our head uh, and so as I prayed that night and the lord spoke to me and told me all about him, this man and gave me his life story, the, the problem, what the problem was and what the fix would be. Quite unusual that we get that level of detail uh, about a client after I pray about them. In fact, I can maybe count on, on one hand how many times that's happened. Um, but I went to the, to the man's house and for 50 minutes we exchanged pleasantries. He was quite a macho kind of guy. And uh, I said, so why, why are you asking for my help? What's the problem? And he couldn't tell me. He actually said, I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you the words. I'm so embarrassed. I don't know where we go from here because if I can't tell you, you can't help me. Um, I said, well, actually, I believe I know what the problem is already. He said, how could you know? Nobody knows. My wife doesn't know what the problem is. I'm not told anybody what this problem is. It's so private. I said, well, I was praying in the car on the way here tonight and God told me what the problem was and he actually started laughing this is uh, this is going to be rich this will be interesting okay then tell me what did God say what is the problem and I said well God told me that you work as a fireman and 10 years ago um, you were involved uh, in an accident you went to attend a road traffic accident and as you attended the road traffic accident you misused a piece of equipment you broke the piece of equipment and the man you were trying to save died. You didn't get him out of the car. You've never been able to forgive yourself. You're struggling with that. And you've been self-medicating for 10 years with alcohol. And now the alcohol is such a problem that the night that you, the day that you phoned me, uh, you drove your car with your two children in the car whilst you were intoxicated. And he burst into tears. He broke down in tears and he says, that's impossible that you know that. Nobody knows. Nobody knows that. I've never told anybody that. And incredibly, God reached them that night. Who would not be grabbed by that moment? And uh, lo and behold, um, a few months later, um, he's no longer got a problem with alcohol. Uh, he is a Christian. He's given his life to this God who's healed him. And uh, he now plays in a praise band. Um, a life changed, a life transformed. He's now a very present father to his two children. Uh, he has a very happy wife and a very happy life together. Uh, another example of uh, God's guidance uh, on my life and, and the breakthrough that, that it can have. Um, one day I, I went to speak uh, with uh, another Christian leader. I actually went to speak about uh, 
Businessmen's Fellowship and about how uh, our organisations could work together. Um, it was a business, Christian business um, uh, charity in in, uh, in, a, in one of the cities in, in Scotland. And uh, I'd been trying for over a year to meet this uh, this uh, leader of this organisation. And finally, I, I'd tied her down to a meeting uh, and I went to meet her. And as I was praying, walking to the meeting, saying, Father, I pray that you'd direct my words today, that you would help me to say the right things. Um, and I pray that you would work through me and um, that your will would be done in this situation. Um, and anything you want me to do, I'm, I'm here to do it. And as I spoke those words, the Lord spoke to me and said, don't talk about businessman's fellowship to this woman. I thought, what? That's, that's ridiculous. I've been trying for a year to do this, to have this meeting, to talk to her about your organisation. Why would I not speak about businessman's fellowship? And he told me this, this woman's struggling. This woman's thinking about taking her own life. And you have to tell her that you are here as a psychologist to help her and that I've sent you. So as we sat down uh, over a cup of coffee and exchanged some pleasantries, she says, tell me why you're here today. I said, well, I'm actually not here to talk about Businessman's Fellowship. Um, the Lord's told me that you're really struggling in life and he has sent me as a psychologist to help you with your challenges and your struggles. And she broke down in tears immediately uh, and she sobbed and she said, I, I can hardly believe that God has answered this prayer. I'd given him one week to save my life. And if he didn't, uh, with all the pain and struggles that I've had, I was going to end my life. Um, and so I worked with her as a psychologist and uh, she now runs her own business. Uh, life has become very different for her. This is what God does. The Lord, God is the giver of life. He knows all things. He knows everything about us. And he loves us passionately. And he wants the best for us in life. Um, one last example from psychology. Um, a few years ago, uh, my pastor's wife came to me and spoke to me. Um, she was on a, a parent council for a school and uh, the Scottish government had released some funding for a very a particular project in Scotland. And um, one third of the project was about uh, uh, health and well-being, um, which was going to open some doors for some businesses to work with. Uh, children and uh, the pastor's wife came and spoke to me and said that God spoke to her in that meeting that she had heard about this project and said God's told me Stephen that you have to work in this project I thought wow I'm I'm not so sure that's right I'm, I'm very busy very very busy I'm absolutely flat out busy but I went and prayed about it and sure enough the Lord spoke to me and said I want you to work in these schools I said Lord there's there's so many ways that uh, I could present psychology in these schools to help children, but I've never really worked with children before. Uh, but I know the techniques that I use in, in sports psychology, for example, with motivation and confidence uh, would really benefit children. But how do I present that in a way that's going to be palatable and, and desirable for the, for the schools and for the education um, people in Scotland? And the Lord very specifically showed me um, that I should read up and study ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. It's not an area that I'd studied before. Um, I was obedient to the Lord. I read about ACEs. I studied up on them and uh, I wrote a program um, for uh, schools to teach children um, uh, psychology techniques to overcome the detrimental effect of adverse childhood experiences. Um, and I won contracts with the schools that I approached. And just a month after um, I'd approached the schools, the Scottish government announced that uh, they wanted schools to look into uh, and engage with people who could teach about ACEs. And uh, very quickly, I was recognised as an expert on ACEs throughout Scotland um, because the Lord had directed me uh, that way. My father knows what is before me. Uh, and so he cleared the path and I ended up uh, doing training, uh, teaching head teachers and directors of education about adverse childhood experiences and how we can heal ACEs within the school environment. I worked with over 2000 children over the space of three years um, in, in these schools, um, teaching the children. And we would um, 
do a, a, a test at the start of the, the school year um, to measure emotional scores and various other things. And uh, my programme that the Lord had directed me put, to put together by the end of the school year had improved the emotional scores of 2,000 children by 44%. It was incredible. These are international tests and standards. Um, and uh, there are a great many stories and testimonies came out of that time uh, with the, the children in the schools. Fantastic. Uh, the Lord directed me in that way. And fantastic that the Lord changed so many lives um, during that time. So I'm going to bring things to a, a close now. Um, I just want to say that, that living life with God is the most incredible way to live life. I started out as a teenager asking, how am I going to get the best out of life? How am I going to have a life that I can look back on from my deathbed and say it was all worthwhile, that I made a difference? And all I can say is that everything, everything good that's happened in my life, every, every breakthrough, every great moment, every time that someone else's life has been benefited from, from my life has all been directed by God, all been directed by my Heavenly Father. It's been wonderful, wonderful. And I encourage you, if you don't know God, if you've never taken that step of faith and reached out to him and, or, or, or thought about giving your life and living your life hand in hand with the creator of the universe, I cannot recommend it enough. It's tremendous. It is the best decision I've ever made in my life. It is wonderful. And it's a, it's a life of love. Uh, some people are attracted to God uh, because they think God can, can do wonderful things for them. They're attracted for what God can do for them, um, which is a bit like uh, marrying someone for money. <laughs> Your motives are not pure and you're not going to have a great relationship if you're marrying for money. Um, and you won't have a great experience with God if you're pursuing God uh, because you just want um, God to do good things in your life. Uh, the best of marriages, uh, and I've worked a lot on this in psychology too, the best of marriages are when you, you find someone that you love. And to love someone is sacrificial. You put them first, you meet their needs, and you'll, you'll, you provide uh, for them. When I proposed to my wife um, 22 years ago, I actually said, I want to make you happy for the rest of your life. I want to spend the rest of my life making you happy. And I feel the same with God. I don't have to do anything to prove myself to God. I don't have to do anything to win God's affection. He loves me completely and freely. It's the same with you. You don't have to do anything to win him over. But the best of relationships are just when we enjoy the love. When we spend time together, quality time, we get to know each other. And that's what uh, the Christian life is all about. Getting to know God, experiencing his love, his direction, his impact on your life. Living a life of love, a sacrificial life. Jesus himself said that uh, those who want to keep their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for me will gain life. And it's one of those juxtapositions of life uh, in that um, by surrendering my life to God, that's where I truly found life. People talk about life uh, and that um, it's important that we find um, what life is all about, that we look for the why in life, we look for our gifting, our calling, uh, our purpose in life. How do you find that? Many people have asked me that over the years. How do you find your calling, your purpose, your why, the reason you were created? I, I truly believe that that is only given to us in part day by day as we walk closely with the giver of life, our heavenly father. He reveals these things bit by bit part by part uh, and that's when we are walking in his will to walk in his will uh, is to in, enjoy complete fulfillment in life 
that word that God gave to three people to give to me to move into psychology was that I would help people to fulfill their full God-given potential. And that is the greatest thing that you can achieve with your life, fulfilling your full God-given potential where you do uh, follow God's will for your life. I've given examples of the direction. I would have chosen a different path a hundred times over in these different moments in my life. But God directed me. I prayed, Lord, what do you want me to do? It's not things that I wanted to do at the time. It's not things I would have chosen to do, but they have been the greatest decisions in my life just to be obedient to God and trust them and take a step of faith. The Bible tells us that faith is being sure of the things we hope for and certain of the things that we cannot see. We don't move forward with all the answers, but we move forward in trust and faith in the one who gave us life, who designed our life, who equips us for life and has a plan for our life. As we follow that plan, that's what life's all about. That's the best that you can get from life. And I encourage you tonight, right now, you can have the best in life. You can make that decision. You can give your life sacrificially back to God. And you can discover through that relationship the greatest amount of love and the very purpose for your life and the greatest quality of life that you could ever have where you fulfill uh, the, your, the God-given potential that's been placed within you. So thank you for listening tonight. Um, I wonder if we have any questions. Do we have any questions? Stephen, before we do questions, I think it would be good to give people an opportunity to make that personal relationship with Jesus. I wonder if we do that first of all. Can we uh, get people to uh, commit their life to Christ? You know, the people who are listening tonight, God doesn't have any, any favorites. It doesn't, Stephen isn't just a favorite with God that he speaks to him. God loves everyone just the same. And he wants you to know that same God that Stephen ha has been talking about, the same loving Father who speaks and guides and directs. He wants to direct your life. You know, God says he has a plan for you, just like he has a pl plan for Stephen's life. So I know the plans that I have for you, plans of good, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan and a future for your life. And if you want to know that, God, what do you have to do? The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. And he says we need to repent and turn around our, our, our direction in our life, turn our thought life, turn completely around and start living for God. And to uh, in, invite Jesus into your heart and life, you know, eternal life is a free gift. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And any gift has got to be received. And right now, you can receive that wonderful gift of eternal life and know the same God that Stephen's been talking about tonight. Experience that same relationship. Experience him talking to you and guiding your life. So what I'm going to do is say a simple prayer. And if you are sincere, I ask you to pray this prayer after me and mean it with all your heart. And you too can have eternal life and become a child of God. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus Christ. I come to you now. I confess that I am a sinner because the Bible says we have all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not one, and that includes me. But I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross in my place taking the punishment for my sins and you poured out your precious blood to wash my sins away i repent of my sins i turn away from them i turn to you with all my heart come into my heart lord jesus come into my life right now by your spirit and give to me that free gift of eternal life. 
I receive you now. Thank you for coming into my life. Now I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And that God has raised him from the dead. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me, for making me a child of God. Help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, then click on the link that you'll be given and let us know that you prayed that prayer and there'll be people there to help you and find resources to help you. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Paul now. Thanks again, Stephen, for such a wonderful, inspiring testimony and encouraging testimony. I'm sure many people have been moved by what you shared tonight. But I know there are people who got questions, and I'm going to hand over to Paul now for the questions. Okay, Paul. Bless you, Alan. Thank you for that. Um, just to let you know, Stephen, we've had some fantastic response. So we've had Pastor Kingsley from Doncaster just saying, uh, bless so much from tonight. And he just wants to pass on his best wishes to you. Uh, Mehdi has also uh, wanted to pass on his prayers and best wishes. Um, I'm going to read a few more out. We've had that many on Zoom, some great ones on Zoom. So we've had Dave Riley saying, Stephen, the best phrase you have used tonight is when you ask God, what do you want me to do? Thank you, brother. A very powerful testimony. Blake Morris says hello to you, Stephen. John Harrison says, excellent life, obedient, Stephen, unto the Lord. You've encouraged me. God bless you richly. God has written all our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. Um, just fantastic question, uh, comments. Uh, but before we come to the questions, Stephen, and some prayers that people would, uh, some prayer requests that people have, um, you have a gift of giving out words of knowledge. And, and words to people, Stephen. And I just wonder if you had any words of knowledge for people tonight. Yeah, well, um, in this last week, uh, the Lord has really directed me to uh, uh, two passages in Scripture. Uh, and I just want to share these passages. And um, perhaps, perhaps the Lord will speak to you through them. Um, in the Old Testament, in the uh, First Samuel chapter 16, and uh, in verse one, um, the Lord speaks to the prophet Samuel. Uh, and I was sharing this with uh, the, the UK Council uh, earlier in the week, um, that the uh, Lord speaks to the prophet Samuel after um, the king of Israel, King, king uh, Saul, had been rejected by God. And uh, Samuel was doubting himself. Uh, he was doubting that uh, he had made the right choice by anointing Saul as king when God rejected him later. He was doubting that he had given the right counsel and done the right thing with Saul over the years uh, because things hadn't turned out well. And there's a lot of people doubting that things, because things have not turned out well in their life, they're doubting themselves. And God speaks to Samuel at this time and says, how long will you mourn for Saul, whom I have rejected? Uh, that's the first thing that God says. And I wonder if God's saying to you today, how long are you going to stay stuck in that negative place? When you're looking at the past, you're reflecting on the, the past, you're punishing yourself uh, for all the for something that's went wrong, and you're replaying the situation, uh, what I could have done, what I could have said. Um, and that leads to torment. It leads to depression and anxiety. The second part of what God says to Saul is, is to fill your horn with oil, um, and to, to go because I've got a, a new work for you to do. I've got you, I've got you to go and anoint the future king of Israel. And the best thing you can do in life when something bad has happened is draw a line in the sand. Forget about it. Move on because life goes on. And if you live life with God, he always has the next step planned for you. His plan for your life is not just a good plan, it's the plan. Uh, and therefore, that's the place to go to get fresh direction. We need to cut off the past. You need to let it go. It's done. You can't change it. You can't change it at all. Um, and therefore, you must move forward to the new thing that God has before you. 
So God's trying to speak to some people tonight to say, do not punish yourself with those negative thoughts, analyzing over and over, but what you could have done, what you could have said, draw the line in the sand, move forward and look for what God has ahead for you. That's the first one. Uh, and the second uh, verse I would like to, to share, second piece of scriptures from the New Testament, from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, uh, where Paul writes, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will know what God's will is, his good, perfect and pleasing will. You can be transformed. Some people doubt whether they can be transformed, whether they can do better in life, that they, whether they can move forward in life. People think they're too broken or there's something wrong with them, that things just don't go well, they just don't go your way. Uh, Again, you need to bend that type of thinking. You need to draw a line in the sand because the Lord's saying to you, uh, not you can be transformed. He's saying be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that really is the ministry that God's called me to, the work that he's called me to, working with over 4,000 people. And I have seen uh, thousands of people now transformed by the renewing of their mind and the real gift the wonderful thing at the end of that transformation, as you move forward and fulfill your full potential in life, is that you get to see what God's purpose and plan for your life is. And that's what the second half of that verse says, that after your mind has been transformed, then you will see what God's will is, his good, perfect and pleasing will. So many people ask me, how do I know what God's will is for my life? It's by taking a step of faith and moving forward and allowing God to transform you. Asking him on a daily basis, what do you want me to do? And giving him permission to transform you. Uh, and so, again, for the people tonight who are um, listening uh, and, and really doubting whether they um, can do anything wonderful in their life uh, or they're wondering why they can't find God's plan for their life, the good news is, that you can be transformed and more than that you will be transformed uh, through the renewing of your mind as you read scripture as you seek god in prayer as you move forward to him um, and worship him and seek to serve him uh, praise god um miriam has asked can you pray for her um she's uh, dealing with me at the moment um and i know that you've spoken about seeing god uh, move and healing through prayer and I know that you prayed for others who've been uh, healed so I just wondered if you'd pray for Miriam tonight and if anybody else has a prayer request this night please post it uh, here on the Zoom yeah. or on Facebook. Well I'd like to encourage everybody that's watching tonight that uh, if you're a believer the um, Bible tells us that the, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead uh, is within you and there's I know there's a lot of people watching tonight who have uh, prayed prayers of faith and seen uh, dozens hundreds thousands of people uh, healed and so let's all join together in this prayer the prayer for mm. for Miriam so Miriam uh, we pray in Jesus name we ask yeah. father heavenly father that you would heal Miriam of this ME whatever the issue is in our body lord that you would uh, perform a creative and healing miracle. Uh, we, we, we ask the Lord to bless you, Miriam, in everything that you do. And we ask the Lord to bless your body with healing. Uh, and we ask that you would uh, extend your hands right now mm -hmm. towards, towards God uh, mm -hmm. and receive right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Father, we know that you are the one that heals. No one else can do it apart from mm -hmm. you. And so, Father, we ask, we ask yeah. that you would heal Miriam completely yes. from yes, the top of her head to the, to, to the bottom of her toes. Yes, It'd be a complete restoration of, of the, her body and of her Thank mind. You, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That this, this issue of ME would be a thing of the past, that a line would be drawn in the sand, and that there would be transformation. In Jesus' name, we thank Amen. you, Lord. Amen. 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 Bless you for that, Stephen. Um, Stephen, we do have a question. Um, it's a tricky one. Um, not surprisingly from George Collins and he, he wants to, and he wants to know how do you balance um, psychology in the Bible um, is there any conflicts that you come up against 
That's, that's a great question, George. George is a very wise and learned man, <laughs> uh, as we all know. Yes. Uh, great question, George. And it's a question I've been asked uh, many times in different places, different different countries. Um, and for me, it's been a fantastic journey uh, understanding psychology and discovering uh, what psychologists have found and in, in, in neuroscientists, etc. because they're, they're only discovering what God's done. They're only discovering how, how amazing and marvelous God's creation is. Uh, the human brain uh, is an absolute marvel, and it's one of the greatest parts of God's creation, I believe. You know, your brain um, contains over 100 billion brain cells, and each of these brain cells can communicate uh, 200 different pieces of information per second to 1,000 other brain cells, um, uh, so that the, the transfer of information in your brain um, is better than a, a supercomputer, the, the world's first supercomputer that was built to, um, to uh, match that, that level was built in 2015. It's about the size of a school, this computer. It's a huge thing. It's uh, got 250,000 data processors to match what God has designed in the human brain. Our brain's about the size of a fist. And uh, this computer that's matched the human brain for uh, information transfer is the size of a very large building. Uh, God's design is incredible. Um, we have 60,000 thoughts in a day. Uh, our brain receives over 2 million pieces of information per second from our body um, that it uh, uses. It's incredible. But let me give you one example of where psychology really has caught up clearly with, with, uh, with the Bible. Um, psychologists, through a lot of studies, have found that techniques that we use, they take six weeks to create a long-lasting change. Six weeks for transformation. Um, and six weeks is about 40 days, 42 days if your maths is, is, is exact. But there are five instances in scripture of transformation over a 40-day period. Wow. So the 40-day the period, uh, is, that number is important to God. It doesn't pick these numbers but at random. So it takes 40 days uh, to make a transformation. So I'm just wondering if all the biblical scholars who are watching this can think of five scriptural situations where there's 40 day periods mentioned. Um, I'll put you out your misery. Um, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days before he starts his ministry. Up until then, he's been working in the family business with his hands. Uh, he's a carpenter. Um, so he has a 40-day period of transformation, of getting ready, prepared, changed to pick up the mantle of this ministry, this three-year ministry that shook the world and turned it upside down. Uh, the other four instances are all in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, the flood, when God's got Noah, a righteous man, and, and all the other righteous people that were living at the time to go in the, the ark to really start again. And he spent 40 days trying to wash sin out of the world. Uh, other examples are um, Goliath taunted the armies of Israel for 40 days before David stepped forward in faith. For 40 days, the army of Israel was, was gripped by fear and anxiety and worry um, until uh, David stepped forward and did the whole trash talking it's great it's like you see it in the boxing matches now the trash talking where Goliath says I'm going to feed your body to the birds this day and now David says no I'm the one that's going to triumph because I don't come in my own strength I come in the strength of the living God Amen. he will deliver you into my hands this day and uh, I will remove your head from your body and that's what happens this little tiny shepherd boy brings down Goliath the eight foot giant this killer of thousands of men and uh, knocks him out with a stone and draws Goliath's sword and takes Goliath's head with his own sword. And in that moment was the moment of transformation. After 40 days of fear, the army of Israel is then filled with faith and they rise up in faith and they chase down the Philistine army. Transformation. Uh, the other two examples are uh, Jonah goes and preaches to Nineveh for 40 days uh, and they repent. And the other one is Elijah, one of God's prophets, who, after some amazing miracles, um, is filled with depression and 
I've seen some psychology articles on this about the signs of depression and Elijah. And uh, he basically lies down on the ground and says to God, I just want to give up. I'm the last one here that believes in you now. Um, didn't think there was anybody else, but there was. There was other people. But God ministered to him, sent an angel to give him food um, and, and drink. And 40 days later, after Elijah feeling so far away from God, 40 days later, Elijah is on the mountainside, on the mountaintop. And God passes by so close, right in front of his face. 40 days of transformation and Elijah is in top form as a prophet after that. So yeah, the Bible, thousands of years ago, was talking about these 40-day periods of transformation of life, transformation of attitude, transformation of knowledge and of experience, life-changing transformations in 40 days. And psychologists have caught up with that and realized that the techniques we use, it takes at least 40 days to create the transformation. Wow. Powerful, Stephen. Wow, really? Powerful. I'm going to hand back to Alan, but um, so blessed by your brother, so blessed by what you've shared with us this night. And um, if you uh, obviously want to talk to us, please go through the link we put onto Facebook. Please go there. Even if you're a Christian and you're going through to that salvation prayer link, go through, leave your details if you want to do any follow up with us. We'd love to speak to you after this night. Alan. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Stephen, it's been great listening to you. I've heard you speak on a number of occasions, quite a lot of occasions, actually, but I never get tired of hearing you. I get inspired every time I hear you, brother. You've got a wonderful gift. God's given you that gift that he promised he would give you, and you've been using it. And I, we thank God for so many lives that have been transformed through your ministry. But I want to just pray for you. Father, I just pray for Stephen, Lord. I just thank you for the work that he's been doing. And I pray, God, that you'll keep him strong, Lord, and that you'll keep him going in this work you've called him to. I pray you bless his family. I pray you'll take care of him, Lord. Protect him from every work of the enemy, Lord. And I pray that you will bring the people across his path whose lives can be transformed, Lord, as he's there in, standing as an instrument in your hands, Lord, a co-laborer with you, Lord. Oh, I just pray, Lord, continued blessing and anointing upon Stephen, Father. Use him greatly in his coming days, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alan, Alan, yes? just, just wondered if you'd pray for Lester before we leave. Uh, Lester has just been put into lockdown. Um, they've just been told they must stay in lockdown for another two weeks. So I just wondered if you just pray for Lester before we finish. Yeah, Lord, we, we pray for Lester that with the situation there, this lockdown with the COVID-19. Father, we just pray, God, that you will undertake in Leicester. Lord, we've targeted Leicester before with life stories. And Lord, we just pray that the Christians there will be strong and they will be a good witness to the people there in Leicester. Amen. Lord, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you will bring deliverance to the people in Leicester. Oh, yeah. God, have mercy on those people, we pray, Lord. Lord, those who are facing this terrible disease at this time, Lord, we yeah. pray, God, you'll cause many to turn to you, Lord, yes, and find in you the help yes. they need, Lord. You are their yes. very present help in time of need, and I pray that many in Leicester will turn to you, Amen. Lord. In Jesus' name we ask, Lord. Amen. Amen. So, thank you again, Stephen. For your welcome. Thank you for all those who've been watching tonight. And please click on our website, go and look there. There are many, many other life stories on that website. And we look forward to welcoming you again next Monday. Next Monday, we have a former terrorist from Northern Ireland who's going to be sharing a wonderful story. Each Monday, we get blessed. And so we will invite you to come next week and tell your friends about these. Zoom meetings on Monday evening. God bless you. May you, God be with you during this coming week. May he guide you. May he direct you. May he bless you and your family. In Jesus' name, amen.